I'm going to become champion of the Fearon region. Just you wait. <laughs> Unlikely, as you have to get through me first. Let's show them who's boss. Go, Berserker! Oh, the crash! <laughs> Welcome. I recently just posted the entire Fear and Pokedex, so if you haven't checked that out yet, I definitely recommend doing so. But this video will be a follow up to that video as it introduces all of the Forge Form weapons found within the Fearin region's hypothetical games Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn. Forge Forms being the result of the Transforge mechanic found throughout the Fearin region. If you like what you see and want to learn more about these games, their story, and charming cast of characters, I highly recommend checking out my Fearin Saga Supercut video, as it's an all-in-one adventure. However, in this video, you'll get a glimpse not only at all of the Forge Form weapons, but many of which I have not even introduced yet, either on my Instagram or here on my YouTube channel. I'll also be going in-depth into the Transforge mechanic and exactly how it works both in and out of battle, including some changes I've made in the recent months. So prepare yourself, Pokemon trainers, because battles are a lot more challenging in the Fearin region. A fantastical place with a variety of diverse and breathtaking landscapes, each housing magical and mighty creatures known as Pokemon, wielded by fierce warriors known as Pokemon Trainers. Over the next several videos on my YouTube channel, I plan to take you on an epic adventure through my imagination, as I'll fully explore the sagas of the Fearin region just as they would unfold in its conceptual games Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn, introducing all of the characters you'd encounter on your journey and their Pokemon teams, including some familiar faces from all over the Pokemon world. But first, you must select the starter Pokemon that will be accompanying you on your quest. You have the Grass Cub Berry, the Fire Pony Feloga, and the Bubble Crab Krabub. So which of these three will be your secret weapon in the Fearin region? I've been exploring the Fearin region in an ongoing series here on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram page at Mikemon underscore regions, commissioning a variety of talented artists to help bring all of my ideas and designs to life and take you on an exciting journey through my imagination in my own little corner of the Pokemon world inspired by Iceland and Norse mythology. So if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit that like button, and if you'd like to learn even more about the Fearin region, make sure to check out some of my previous videos and subscribe to my channel for even more Fakemon content, as the Fearin region is only the tip of the iceberg, as I have a variety of other exciting projects in the works that you can't find anywhere else. I'd like to give a big shout out to one of my favorite artists of all time and good friend, Trainer Matt, who I commissioned to draw the art for all of the Forge Form weapons featured in this video, so please give him a big round of applause because he absolutely killed it and I had a blast working with him as I always do. I'd also like to give a big shout out to the talented artist Yes Sir who animated the amazing 3D scenes featured in this video to help me show you how I always imagined the Transforge mechanic to look and work. This mysterious power was created by the divine Pokemon at Loden, as this omniscient Pokemon having foreseen a grave threat, destroying the Fearin region back at the time it was known as the ancient Cedar region, was desperate to find a warrior worthy of wielding it, as it saw the true potential behind the bond of Pokemon and people fighting side by side. This was proven by the heroes of the Voyage Clan, the group of settlers that founded the Fearin region back at this time, which is explored in my all-in-one adventure and Legends Arceus inspired video Pokemon Legends Romdahl. The Voyage Clan originally saw Pokemon only as mere weapons, to conquer foreign regions especially after discovering the magic and might of the Transforge mechanic. However, the protagonist of the story with help of a few other enlightened trainers was able to prove that people and Pokemon, even when in their Forge forms, are more powerful when bonded. For centuries now it has been seen as taboo and barbaric by most people, only being used illegally in the shadows by groups such as Team Brain or Team Brawn, or by the Fearn League as a means to defend the region. And stigma aside, only the strongest of trainers are even capable of wielding a forge form as it is so dangerous and does require a lot of training out of the trainer themselves. Now that we know a little bit about its origins and in-game lore, 
let's take a look at the mechanic itself and how it works. The Transforge Phenomenon is the heart and soul of the Firin region and the new gimmick or mechanic that most modern day regions have. Using an ancient item known as the Battle Bracer, the trainer is able to transforge certain Pokemon into powerful magical living weapons known as Forge Forms and enter the battle. And while wielding a Forge Form weapon, the trainer has access to all four of that Pokemon's known moves during the turn-based style sections of the battle, as well as a powerful finisher move in the Warzone style sections of the battle that can totally change the tide of the battle. This move is accessed after fully filling out your Forge Force gauge, which is a gauge at the bottom of the screen that fills up each turn and each time you deal damage depending on the amount of damage you dealt, with your best chances of filling it being within the Warzone style sections of battle. And I'm sure you're probably wondering what that means. What really makes the Transforge mechanic so unique is the mechanic itself, as it totally changes the way the game is played, with more action RPG freestyle sections sprinkled in between the turn-based style sections known as War Zones. They will start like a normal battle. Things wouldn't really change until you or your opponent transform one of your Pokemon into its Forge Form weapon, which like most mechanics you can do at any time or not at all. All the gym leaders however will definitely be doing so in their battles, so in order to level the playing field, I recommend doing the same. So after a Pokemon is transformed into a Forge Form weapon by either trainer, there is a short 60 second window where the battle is not your typical turn based battle, and you can freely run around the surrounding area and attack RPG style. Think Legends Arceus meets Kingdom Hearts. So if you wield a Forge Form weapon, this period of time can be used to help build your Forge Force gauge or deal some damage before making your normal turn based moves. But if your opponent, let's say Julia has a Forge Form weapon in this time, and you don't, you basically need to spend this time dodging her attacks. Speaking of which, as her Dymoth bow is a piercer type, it has both close range attacks using the blade of her bow, or even long distance attacks shooting off diamond arrows. So evading her attacks may prove to be challenging, but you can hide behind larger rocks on the beach to give you some coverage from her long distance arrow attacks. After this 60 second free period is up, both players use their previously selected turn based moves and then select their moves for the next turn, which were selected before this period, and then after this period, they select their moves for the next turn, and so on and so forth. So after you use these turn-based moves, there's yet another 60 second free period to get some damage in and try to build your Forge Force gauge up, as doing so either lets you use your powerful finisher move, reinstate your shields that work like raid bosses when first using your Forge Form, or even switch out to another Forge Form weapon in your arsenal. After doing any of these, the Forge Force Gauge is depleted, that is until you fill it up again, which is done by dealing damage both in your turn-based attacks or in the RPG freestyle period. It's also important to note that oftentimes in these RPG style free periods, mini bosses in the form of powerful wild Pokemon from the surrounding area will enter the battle for this free period, either attacking you or your opponent, so you can choose to evade them or spend your time defeating them, which is yet another way to help build up your Forge Force gauge. In fact, this is the fastest way to do so, as they are a lot easier to defeat within this limited time period. Like I said, in this free period, these mons are fairly easy to defeat as long as you dedicate yourself to doing so. Think Heartless or Nobodies or Dream Eaters in Kingdom Hearts. Being as that's one of my favorite video game series, as well as the fact that it has such a family-friendly and cartoon style similar to Pokemon due to its inclusion of Disney characters, that is always the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of the Forge Form battles. After fully charging up your Forge Force gauge, you can not only access your powerful finisher move in the War Zone and potentially end the battle before even selecting your move for the turn, as it's essentially an extra attack, but each Forge Form weapon has its own unique finisher move in the War Zone that I will cover in this video. But you can also either hit the Aura option, aka Pokemon's Aura Armor that naturally protects the trainer in battle, once again just like bosses in raid battles. This is to help make wielding Forge Forms more plausible, given if you faint while wielding a Forge Form you once again automatically lose the battle. So the Aura Armor basically makes it so you can't be OTK'd after transforging your Pokemon and entering the battle. It also offers in-game lure into why the trainer isn't seriously hurt while involved in these Pokemon battles. The last option when your Forge Force gauge is charged is Arsenal, which allows you to switch out your current Forge Form weapon for another in your party, 
While you could still switch out to a new Pokemon naturally after wielding a weapon, you can only use the Transforge mechanic once per battle like most mechanics, so normally you'd be stuck with the weapon you selected. But filling your Forge Force gauge and selecting this option is a game changer as it lets you access another Forge Form weapon and change battle tactics, especially within the War Zone sections. And some trainers will even make use of this, like Cynthia, who has a weapon for all four weapon classes, making her a versatile battler. And after selecting any of these three options, when your Forge Force gauge is filled, it will be emptied. But don't worry, it can be filled again. So make sure to get in as many attacks on your foe and take out as many mini-boss Pokémon as possible within the War Zones to help fill your Forge Force gauge. Also, only one trainer needs to be wielding a Forge Form weapon for the War Zone sections to go into play. Meaning if another player isn't wielding a Forge Form weapon, the player who is would be attacking the Pokémon the other player currently has out, and not the defenseless trainer. This would be no different than attacking mini-bosses, only difference being they will have more health and be harder to take out than the weaker mini-bosses, so it will be harder to fill your Forge Force gauge. Also, they still would be able to defend themselves and attack back, but it will all be auto attacks, meaning that player or you literally need a Forge Form weapon to fight for yourself in these Warzone sections. Otherwise, your fate is left up to AI. So this is more incentive for players to use Forge Form weapons and make the most of the Warzone sections. There are four Forge Form weapon classes, Slasher, Defender, Piercer, and Wrecker. It's also fun to point out that the Fearn Region's Elite Four not only each specialize in a Pokémon type, but each have mastered one of the four weapon classes as well. The four divine Pokémon that rule over the Fearn Region are all inspired by Norse gods, also each having a forge form of one of the four weapon classes, each inspired by that god's magical weapon in Norse mythology or Iceland's poetic Eddas and sagas. I didn't do any modern weapons like guns or anything like whips as I really wanted to stick to the Viking weapons or the weapons found in Norse mythology as those are what inspired the Transforge mechanic in the first place as well as fit the aesthetic of the Fearin region. But if you want Pokemon with guns, now you have Pal World. I also didn't include any magical weapons like staffs or wands as Forge Form weapons are already magical weapons with the ability to access that Pokemon's moveset, for example, magical attacks such as Flamethrower, Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, you name it, not to mention their powerful finisher move. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, why not just grab a Hone Edge and go into battle? But that's just not how Forge Forms work. Because once again, Forge Forms are not only magical weapons, but when wielding a Forge Form, the trainer is guided and protected by that Pokemon's aura, which wouldn't be the case with any old Hone Edge, meaning that trainer would be vulnerable to attacks. Whereas a trainer wielding a Forge Form weapon is guarded over by that Pokemon's aura, and that Pokemon is actually the weapon and very much part of the fight as the trainer and the Pokemon's spirits are linked. So the Pokemon is very much part of the battle, it's not just the trainer taking the reins, even though it is a more hands-on and definitely dangerous way of Pokemon battling. First we have the slasher type weapons being axes, swords, and scythes. Axe is obviously being the most common viking weapon which is why I chose to make all three of the starter forge forms be axes. Swords were also very common back in that time, and for a lot of you who didn't know this, scythes were actually very popular in Iceland, mostly for farming and such, but they are a part of the history. Slasher types are the most common of the weapon types, and the swiftest as well, allowing for you to get more attacks in and really hack away at your enemy's health. Slasher type swift attacks can lead to a string of combo attacks unique to the slasher type, which if executed properly, will take off an extra chunk of your enemy's health at the end of the combo. And all Forge Form weapons have a held down attack, which leaves you vulnerable but really pays off if you manage to unleash it, and for slasher types, that leads to a powerful spin attack. And there will sometimes be slight variations between these charged attacks depending on the forge form weapon. Piercer type weapons are the most versatile of them all, coming in the form of spears, tridents, lances, and bows shooting magical arrows. The fact they can be used for both close combat and long distance combat also makes them extra versatile and handy if mastered. The bows shoot magical arrows that can be charged, to do even more damage if the attack lands with their charge attack. And spears work the same way, being thrusted several feet ahead to strike foes from a greater distance than most weapons, and if charged, can even be thrown at the foe from farther away to deal massive damage. Defender type weapons, of course, are all shields. They say the best offense is a good defense. The defender type weapons are notably the weakest weapons, at least in the freestyle war zones, but they can do damage as they are used to bash into foes. And more importantly, they automatically protect you from all head-on enemy attacks in the war zone without even having to block, but also have a longer period of time than other weapon types to perform a counterattack and reflect certain enemy attacks back on them. For their charge attacks, you'll literally charge at the foe bashing into them. 
a handful of defenders even have cannons allowing for long distance attacks that can be charged up just like the magical arrows for bows in place of the normal defender type charging attack. Wrecker types are massive weapons such as hammers, maces, and clubs that are used to smash foes. Wreckers are the strongest of the forge form weapons, especially in the war zone as every hit takes off a decent chunk of damage. They can even deal damage through blocks or against defender type weapons. The only drawback being they are the slowest of the forge form weapons, so the attacks take longer to execute. So this weapon class is definitely for more skilled trainers as it takes more time to really master. And like all the other weapon classes, it has a charge attack, that can be devastating if landed, where they smash their weapon down on the foe. There are even a handful of weapons that can be dual wielded, but only in double battles. That's because double battles are a very big part of the Firen region, and to even the playing field as there are some double battles against two trainers wielding forge forms, or even some trainers who are capable of dual wielding forge form weapons. Any axe, sword, or spear can be paired together or paired with a shield but you won't be able to dual wield any heavier weapons like hammers or weapons like bows that would require an extra hand. But dual wielding would be a lot of fun and you'd have plenty of opportunities to do so within the Furin region. And it would certainly spice up double battles. And each weapon class has its own benefits both in and outside of battle, including their own playstyle in the freestyle warzone sections of battle. The forge form weapon you're wielding acts as your held item while active in battle with a boosted effect in place of a held item. So that transforged Pokemon's item will be useless while wielding it as a forge form, but replaced with this class determined weapon bonus. Slash type weapons increase the chance of critical hits landing by 10%. Defender type block additional effects of attacks taken, such as status conditions or stat lowering. Piercers increase accuracy by 10%. And record types increase the chance of flinching by 10%. Outside of battle, forge forms can temporarily be called upon to perform various tasks similar to HMs as long as that transforged capable Pokemon is in your party. Slashers are used to essentially replace cut to not only cut down trees, shrubs, and vines to access blocked off areas like in previous games, but chopping down trees over ravines can even create bridges to access new areas. Sometimes wild Pokemon or berries will even appear from the bush or tree. Defenders are used to traverse through those strong windstorms that occasionally plague the more open or mountainous areas of the Firen region, as Iceland is known for its harsh weather and strong winds. Normally without a defender type, you'd just be blown back by the howling wind and unable to progress in that area or for that time, but using a defender type weapon allows you to push through the wind. Piercers can be used to shoot arrows or throw a spear to knock items and even Pokemon down from trees or other out of reach places like cliff ledges and rooftops. They can also be used to knock certain Pokemon out of the sky, making them easier to catch. Wreckers are used to replace rock smash and destroy boulders or blocks of ice to retrieve items or access blocked off areas. They're especially useful in the region's caves and glaciers. And all the Forge Form weapons can be used out of battle in various ways by calling upon your Pokemon's horror to help you. For example, working together alongside your Pokemon's Auror, you can move large boulders or other obstacles like Strength. You can also use your Pokemon's Auror and Glowing Forge Form weapon to illuminate dark areas at night or in the caves. And even to perform a War Cry with your Pokemon's Auror raising your weapon into the air in order to attract rare and high level Pokemon in the area. However, this feature can only be used after already defeating a handful of wild Pokemon in that area. Speaking of forge forms like Galar and the Paldea region, the Furin region would have its own form of raid battles. You'd find giant rune stones throughout the Furin region, transporting you to raid dens with rampaging Pokemon in the same manner as the previous games. However, a lot of these raids would be led not by a rampaging Pokemon, but instead by an Iron Knight or Golem known as a raider. These raiders are not human, they were actually created by the Divine Pokemon, at Lodin, the father of the Forge Form phenomenon, in order to stand up to Team Brain and Team Brawn as they are led by the two divine Pokemon seeking to overthrow it and conquer the Firen region, as well as a way to test trainers in order to find a worthy successor of wielding its power, since its current partner champion Odin is growing weaker by the day with age. So these raiders are magical beings that will wield a Forge Form weapon just as a trainer would. And like regular raids, the Pokemon Forge Form weapons they use would vary with some monthly events to get special ones like starter Pokemon, legendaries, or shinies in the form of 7 star raid bosses. Once defeating the raider, they will collapse as that forge form weapon will turn back into its normal Pokemon form as you will now be able to capture it and if you do so, that Pokemon will automatically have a forge mark allowing it to access its forge form as you wouldn't be required to do the way of the warrior super training 
as you would have to with most Forge Form capable Pokemon, before being able to transform them into their Forge Form weapon. In my head canon, this is because this requires a true bond between the Pokemon and the trainer, as well as peak physical and mental stamina from both of them as well, hence the Brain and Brawn titles. So if the Pokemon feels that their trainer is not ready to enter the battle, they're basically putting their foot down in order to protect them. Or maybe the Pokemon doesn't feel they're ready to enter the battle, as they're being trained in the way of the warrior as well. Regardless, it requires a bond between the Pokemon and Trainer, and they both have to be on equal playing fields in order to access the full power of the Forge Form mechanic, as it really is a team effort on both of their part. It's important to note that the Way of the Warrior Super Training can also be used on any Pokemon, even those that aren't capable, as this will replace the regular Super Training from previous games and is a good way to max out that Pokemon's EVs and IVs for the more competitive players. Now that we know more about the Transforge mechanic and just how Forge Forms function, let's take a look at all of the Forge Form weapons obtainable in the hypothetical games Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn, as well as its two DLCs, The Queen's Beauty and The King's Bounty, and even its Legends-inspired game Pokemon Legends Realm Doll, acting as a prequel to Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn. And of course, if you like the video, please make sure to hit the like button and leave a comment down below to let me know which of these Forge Form weapons is your favorite, what you think of the mechanic, and if any of them would be your secret weapon in the Firin region. Grass-type starter Berserker's Forge Form is a battle axe and slasher-type weapon. Its finisher move, Woodland Rampage, engulfs a user in a whirlwind of razor-sharp leaves as they execute a furious frenzy of savage slashes. This Forge Form will be wielded by your rival if you picked Krabub, and your mother if you picked Faloga. Fire-type starter Helseldor's Forge Form is a Hammer Axe. Although it is a slasher-type weapon, it makes use of its hammer function, smashing off a chunk of the foe's health at the end of its combo attacks, unique to slasher weapons. Its finisher move, Infernal Gallop, calls upon eight phantom orbs that transform into fiery phantom hoofs that stomp down onto the foe in quick succession. This Forge Form will be wielded by your rival if you picked Barry, and your mother if you picked Krabub. Water-type starter Vikrab's Forge Form is a Viking Axe of the Slasher type. It also functions like a giant scissor or crab claw. Its finisher move, Oceanic Chop, launches a giant wave of razor-sharp water at the foe. This Forge Form will be wielded by your rival if you picked Valoga, and your mother if you picked Barry. Jirfel Cold's Forge Form is a Piercer-type bow that shoots magical ice arrows for its long-distance attacks and uses the blades of the bow for its close combat attacks. Its finisher move, Arctic Air Raid, is unique as the wings of its bow come alive, taking the user into the sky, soaring straight at the foe engulfed in a gust of icy wind. This move can even give the foe frostbite. This forge form will be wielded by version-exclusive Elite Four members, Wife, Swinter, and Winda. Dymos Forge Form is a piercer-type bow with magical diamond arrows for its long-distance attacks, and it uses the blades of its bow for its close combat attacks. Its finisher move, Crystal Shard Storm, shoots a diamond arrow into the air that magically splinters off in several diamond arrows that rain down on the foe in quick succession, each taking off a chunk of health. This Forge Form is the secret weapon wielded by the dazzling rock-type gym leader, Julia. Pokemon Brain exclusive, Chillinx's Forge Form, is a sword of the slasher type. Its finisher move, Phantom Frostblade, has its blade turn spectral and grow as the user unleashes several large phantom slashes. This move can even leave the foe with Frostbite. Pokemon Brawn exclusive, Snowwark's Forge Form, is an icy sword of the slasher type as well. Its finisher move, Arctic Chain Strike, has its icy saber turn into a giant ice chain that it uses to hook around the foe and whip them around the field. This move can also leave the foe with the Frostbite status. So Titan's Forge Form is a Mace of the Wrecker type. Its finisher move, Arctic Crusher, smashes the hammer down, unleashing a series of giant pillars of ice from the ground, striking the foe in quick succession. And once again, this move can leave the foe with the Frostbite status. Avalog is a Shield of the Defender type, and its finisher move, Avalanche Assault, has the user throw the icy shield as it grows in size, crushing the foe. Rasquerade's Forge Form is a Sword of the Slasher type. Its finisher move, Midnight Mint, has it disappear into the shadows, reappearing to swiftly strike several times while constantly traveling back and forth between the shadows. This Forge Form is wielded by Skilled Swordsman and Dark-type Elite Four member, Isaac, as he mentors you in the way of the warrior and how to properly wield a Forge Form. 
Aetherain is a piercer type bow that shoots sharp magical aqua arrows for its long distance attacks and uses the blade of its bow for close combat attacks. Its finisher move Aqua Arrow Cascade shoots an arrow into the sky, summoning down a rainstorm of razor sharp water onto the foe. Tyranitar's Forge Form is a Shield of the Defender type with its finisher move Seismic Crunch, summoning several giant spike pillars of stone out of the ground in quick succession. The next three Forge Forms are actually the winners of a Forge Form contest I held on my Instagram page, as I took their designs, made a few adjustments with Trainer Matt, and added them to the Firin region. I was surprised by the overwhelming support for the mechanic, especially as I expected it to be more controversial, I'm not gonna lie, but I had nearly a hundred amazing submissions, some of which just really blew my mind. Which is exactly why I ended up having to choose three winners, and even that didn't feel like enough but I am very pleased with the three I selected, so here they are. Roserade's Forge Form, submitted by DK underscore Fakemon, is a thorny lance of the piercer type with the finisher move Toxic Thorn Spear, having the user throw the spear into the air, spinning around shooting several thorns out around it, which can even poison the foe. Grand Bull's Forge Form is a cutesy hammer of the record type, submitted by Pink underscore Ollie underscore Zam. With its finisher move, Crushing Fangs, looking similar to Play Rough as the user continuously smashes the hammer down on the foe, creating cartoony smoke and shapes with each hit. Golosopod's Forge Form is a Shield of the Defender type, submitted by Drawling Hyroi. Its finisher move, Sea Shield Swirl, has the user throw the shield as it whirlpools around the field, taking off large chunks of the foe's health with each strike. Thank you to everyone who participated in that contest. It was easily one of the highlights of the Firen Saga for me, and I hope to do more contests like that in the future, especially for the new mechanic for my third region, the Zoni region. Gyarados' Forge Form is a Spear and Piercer type weapon. Its finisher move Serpent Spiral has the user hurl the spear at the foe, spiraling in a powerful serpent-like whirlpool. Catlantic's Forge Form is a trident of the Piercer type, with its finisher move Trident Tidal Wave, summoning a massive tidal wave onto the field, crashing down on foe. This Forge Form is the secret weapon wielded by the troubled water type gym leader, Maria from the Zoni region. Lobstew's Forge Form is an axe of the slasher type. Its finisher move, Sizzling Sear Slash, is heated to the point it is steaming as the user serves up some steamy slashes. This move can even burn the foe. This Forge Form is the secret weapon wielded by the hot-headed chef and fire type gym leader Cole. Needle Queen's Forge Form is a spear and piercer type, with its finisher move, Quaking Crown, having the user spike the spear into the ground, summoning a massive earthquake. And Needle King's Forge Form is also a spear of the piercer type, with the same exact finisher move as Needle Queen's Forge Form. Yggdras Soil's Forge Form is a wooden hammer of the Wrecker type that after smashing into the ground summons several giant roots out of the ground that lash out at the foe using its finisher move Timber Break. This Forge Form is a secret weapon wielded by farmer and grass type gym leader Berker. Haxorus's Forge Form is, well of course an axe, of the slasher type with its finisher move Annihilation Axe having the blades of the axe grow to great proportion as the user makes two ferocious swipes at the foe, both dealing massive damage. Being it's known as the armor Pokemon, Agron's Forge Form is of course a shield of the defender type with its finisher move Iron Oppression, shooting several sharp steel spikes at the foe. Shell Scale's Forge Form is a battle axe of the slasher type with its finisher move Spiral Shell Slash, being a giant spin attack engulfed in a whirlwind that sucks nearby foes into its sharp vortex. Exterminite is a bulky record type hammer that summons an army of wild termite out of the ground to swarm its foe after smashing down on the ground using its finisher move Pulverizer. Now creating forge forms for normal types was rather hard because they don't really have that magical element, so I tried to focus on sound based Pokemon, starting with Exploud whose forge form is a shield of the defender type that can attack long distance by shooting sonic blasts out of its mouth, with its finisher move Sonic Boom Blast being a massive sound blast, kind of like Boom Burst, but within the war zones. Tortempo, which is a Pokemon from my first Fakemon region, the Luika region, is a giant drum hammer of the record type. Its finisher move, Seismic Sound Wave, is a giant hammer smash that creates a bunch of massive damaging sound waves around it. Serenoise is another Pokemon from my Luika region to receive a Forge Form in the shape of a beautiful harp bow that shoots magical sound arrows. And its finisher move, Symphony of Arrows, shoots several melodic arrows at the foe as they dance across the field. Oddloam's Forge Form is a bulky shield of the Defender type with its finisher move Gaia Pummel 
having the user rush at the foe as they pummel them into the ground. This forge form is the secret weapon of the humble ground type elite four member Burner. Rammable's forge form is also a defender type in the form of a smoky shield, with its finisher move Smoke Bomb Smash working similarly as they charge into the foe creating several small smoky explosions on contact, which can possibly burn the foe. Armor Rouge's Forge Form is a cannon shield of the Defender type that shoots fire for long distance attacks. Its finisher move Scarlet Scorcher shoots a giant fireball at the foe that explodes on contact, and naturally this move can even burn the foe. Its counterpart Cerulege's Forge Form is obviously a sword of the slasher type that's finisher move Violet Virgil shoots out several razor sharp blades of fire at the foe, and once again this move can even burn the target. And given one is a sword and the other is a shield, they can both be used together and dual wielded in double battles. Go Alert's Forge Form is a massive rocket hammer of the Wrecker type that using its finisher move Burst Breaker can be used to rocket into the air and jet around the field, bashing the foe. Draw Grave's Forge Form is a spooky scythe of the slasher type with its finisher move Soul Snatch Slash making one giant swipe that if it manages to hit the foe not only takes off a chunk of their health but in reference to the Grim Reaper will claim their soul as a bunch of Limbu come burrowing out of the ground to try and drag the foe down to their grave. Both Hoodlefolk's Forge Forms are enchanted scythes of the slasher type. The difference is only aesthetic. They even share the same finisher move Spellbinder Slash as the enchanted blade grows in size as the user gracefully spins around the field, constantly turning invisible and striking the unexpected foe. This forge form is the secret weapon wielded by fairy type leader Ludwig. Ferenian Frigilif's forge form is a majestic shield of the defender type, that with its finisher move Valkyrie's Descent, has the wings on the edge of the shield come to life as the user soars into the sky, constantly swooping down to swiftly strike the foe in glorious fashion. This forge form is the secret weapon wielded by the strongest of the Fear and Gym leaders, Steel Type Specialist Sigrun. Corviknight's forge form is a steel scythe of the slasher type, which launches razor sharp blades of wind at the foe in quick succession with its finisher move Steel Wind Sever. Metagross's forge form is a hammer of the Wrecker type, which using its finisher move Process Pulverizer summons blocks of data that it hurls down onto the foe after bringing down its mighty hammer. Waspark's Forge Form is a high-tech shock spear that electrocutes the foe after using its finisher move Circuit Stinger that can even paralyze the foe. This Forge Form is a secret weapon wielded by one of the electric type twins, Magnus. Flowwatt's Forge Form is a shield of the Defender type, surging with electricity that with its finisher move Circuit Burst can be discharged onto the foe. Of course this move can even paralyze the foe. This Forge Form is a secret weapon wielded by the second of the electric type twins, Mini as you'll be challenging them in a double battle, so you'd even have a chance to dual wield in this battle. Garbotion's Forge Form is a filthy hammer of the Wrecker type that can poison the foe using its finisher move Garbage Batter Riot, which has it bat a giant chunk of toxic waste at the foe that after landing will splatter onto the field. This Forge Form is the secret weapon wielded by Young Activist and the Poison type Elite 4 member Irma. Team Brain exclusive Wisdormer's Forge Form is a magical spear of the Piercer type, resembling a magic staff. This Forge Form is wielded by Team Brawn admin Einar. Team Brawn exclusive Valormer's Fierce Forge Form is yet another spear of the Piercer type. This Forge Form is wielded by Team Brawn admin Gunner. And these two version exclusives share the same finisher move, Dragon Fang Ferocity, which summons a bunch of energy fangs that come crashing down onto the field in succession. Coming from the frozen toe fossil, Lotharium's forge form is a pickaxe of the piercer type, which might come as a surprise, but this is because pickaxes are used to chip away at and excavate, which I classify as a piercer. Its finisher move, Arctic Excavation, ha has its claw blade covered in ice as it starts endlessly picking away at the foe, possibly giving them frostbite. Coming from the frozen horn fossil, Rhinome's Forge Form is a spear of the Piercer type that with its finisher move Polar Thunderhorn has its spear horn charged with electricity as a storm of snow and thunder is summoned onto the field possibly giving them frostbite. Pikachu's new evolution in the Fearin region Gorichu based on the beta Pokemon of course is a Thunder Scythe of the Slasher type that with its finisher move Raging Storm Sever summons a giant serpent like dragon of electricity out of the sky to attack the foe. Eevee's new dragon type evolution in the Fearin region, Drekion's Forge Form, is a dazzling sword of the slasher type wielded by the Dragon Queen herself, Fantasia. 
Its finisher move, Sparkling Scale Slash, has the user swiftly slash away at the foe, dressed in a beautiful array of vibrant colors. Jinx's new evolution, Niflheim's Forge Form, is a beautiful big hammer of the record type that, with its finisher move, Cold Spell Smash, summons a blizzard onto the field after smashing down and will definitely give the foe frostbite. Electivire's Forge Form is an electrified hammer of the record type, using its finisher move, System Smasher, summons giant bolts of thunder onto the field after smashing down, and is guaranteed to paralyze the foe. Magmortar's Forge Form is a fiery hammer of the record type, using its finisher move, Molten Fire Bash, which has molten fireballs rain down from the sky onto the foe after smashing down, which is, as you probably guessed, guaranteed to burn the foe. Absol's Forge Form is an axe of the slasher type, its finisher move, Absolution Blade, shoots a razor-sharp wave of dark energy at the foe. Its counterpart, Retri's Forge Form, is also an Axe of the Piercer type, with its finisher move, Retribution Blade, working similarly to Absol's Forge Form's finisher move, but instead launches a blade of light energy. Both of these Forge Forms are dual-wielded by the antagonist of the second DLC, Twyla, in double battles. So you too will be able to dual-wield in this battle. Spiritomb's elusive evolution, Phantom, is a shadowy cannon shield of the defender type that can shoot souls out for long distance attacks. Its finisher move, Light Swallowing Vortex, creates a giant shadowy vortex sucking all nearby enemies into its dark abyss. Garchomp's Forge Form weapon is a fierce scythe. Its finisher move, Razor Fin Fatality, has the user savagely spin around, hacking away at the foe with their powerful razor sharp scythe. It is wielded by the dreaded Sinnoh champion, Cynthia, while visiting the Firin region, as if she couldn't get any scarier. Akrain is the pseudo of my first fake mon region, the Luika region. Wielded by former champion and king, Akeen, using its finisher move Sovereign Lightspire, summons giant pillars of blinding light that dance around the field dealing massive damage. The first of the Firin pseudos, Yotandra's Forge Form, is a giant ice club inspired by ice giant Ymir's club in Norse mythology that using its finisher move Arctic Club Crash, after smashing down, temporarily covers the field in ice, doing massive damage and is guaranteed to give the foe frostbite. It is also wielded by Fangtasia in the post game. The second of the Fear and Pseudos, Magnarok's Forge Form, is a fiery sword inspired by Fire Giant Surtur's infamous blade in Norse mythology. Its finisher move Doomsday Fire Blade has the user slash the foe with a giant, unavoidable fiery blade that will indeed burn the foe. It is the literal secret weapon of Dark Type Elite 4 member Isaac while battling in the Elite 4. Venusaur's Forge Form is an earthy battle axe of the slasher type. Its finisher move, Floral Frenzy Fury, has the user spin around in a whirlwind of leaves as they launch two razor-sharp leaves at the foe, and suck in and hurt anyone in a nearby radius of their spin. Yes, Charizard gets yet another form, with its Forge Form Bow being a Piercer type. This bow shoots magical fire arrows, and with its finisher move, Flying Fire Fury, has the wings of the blade transform, lifting the user into the sky, where they breathe massive bursts of fire down onto the target below. This weapon is skillfully wielded by the respected Galar champion, Leon, who uses it to fly around the battlefield. Blastoise's Forge Form is a cannon shield, as I'm sure you probably expected, of the Defender type, that can fire blasts of water out of its cannons for its long distance attacks. Its finisher move, Hydro Cascade Fury, has the user bombard the foe with several high pressure water blasts that explode after making contact. And now let's take a quick look at the Forge Form weapons for the Pokemon found in Pokemon Legends Realm Doll's Ancient Cedar region, which once again would explore the origins of the mechanic, setting the stage for the event of Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn. Legend starter Sidereon Chestnut's Forge Form weapon is a mace of the record type. The user smashes down creating a series of steel spikes across the field in succession using its finisher move Thorn Strike Thrash. Legend starter Sidereon Embor's Forge Form weapon is a fiery shield of the Defender type that uses its finisher move Volcanic Impact to have pillars of lava erupt all over the battlefield, potentially burning the foe. Legend starter Sidereon Empoleon's Forge Form is a majestic sword of the Slasher type that uses its finisher move Glacial Wing Blade, which after slashing, hurls an icy tornado at the foe, potentially giving them the Frostbite status. Onyx's new Ice-type evolution, Glaze-6's Forge Form, is a massive ice hammer of the record type. Its finisher move, Boral Bash, has it hit a bunch of giant ice blocks at the foe in succession. Sidereon Whimsicott's Forge Form is a spiky lance of the Piercer type, that's finisher move, Ironbriar Spike, has the lance grow in size as the user continuously jabs a thorny lance at the target. 
Sidiri and Torkoal's regional evolution of Ruptoise's Forge Form weapon is the Defender type Cannon Shield that shoots steam for its far distance attacks, while its finisher move, Steam Cannon Fire, blasts out a giant blast of steam at the foe that is extremely difficult to dodge and will most likely inflict the burn status. Wielded by Voyage Clan Chef, Agot, an ancestor to the Fear and Gym Leader, Cole. Sidiri and Drudigan's regional evolution, Gorgoygon's Forge Form, is a stone battle axe of the slasher type. Its finisher move, Dark Stone Slash, has its stone blade grow as it goes berserk on the foe, executing a series of ruthless stone slashes. Sidirian Tentacruel's formidable Forge Form is a piercer type bow that shoots magical thunder arrows for its long distance attacks and the tentacles that make up its bow move around to attack for close combat. Its finisher move, Electric Arrow Shower, shoots an electric arrow into the air, summoning a thunderstorm onto the battlefield with the electricity coming from the sky, looking like tentacles. Sadir in Dragonite's Forge form is an adorable mallet of the Wrecker type that using its finisher move, Miraculous Mallet, uses the wings on the weapon to soar into the sky before quickly dropping down to perform a powerful yet pretty smash attack directly on the foe. It never misses. Wielded by fearless trainer Alva, an ancestor to both Claire and Lance. And of course there's the title legendary Realm Doll, whose Forge form is an all-powerful rainbow blade of the slasher type. Its finisher move, Rainbow Blitzblade, if landed, will automatically KO the target. This is without a doubt one of the hardest to acquire and strongest of the Forge Forms. Next, I'd like to look at some of the Forge Forms for Legendary Pokemon, many of which are being shown for the first time, so I hope you enjoy. Groudon's Forge Form is a massive club of the Wrecker type, with a powerful finisher move that after bashing into the ground, causes a volcano to erupt in the middle of the battlefield, spewing lava. Kyogre's Forge Form is a giant shield of the Defender type. Its finisher move has the user ride on top of the shield like a surfboard, summoning a massive tidal wave that it uses to crash down directly onto the foe. Cresselia's Forge Form is a Lunar Scythe of the Slasher type. Its finisher move has it spin around, gracefully shooting out several sharp lunar blades. Darkrai's Forge Form weapon is a spooky scythe of the Slasher type, inspired by like a Grim Reaper scythe. Its finisher move has it make a shadowy slash out in front of it that even if it misses the target will create a dark portal that will rapidly grow engulfing everything in its path. Zekrom's Forge Form is an electrified hammer of the Wrecker type. Its finisher move has it use the rocket on its hammer to jet at the foe engulfed in electricity before smashing them. This move will paralyze the target. Reshiram's Forge Form is also a hammer of the Wrecker type with its finisher move working in the same way, except it's engulfed in flames, and it will burn the target. Xerneas' Forge Form is a piercer-type weapon, and bow, which shoots magical light arrows for its long-distance attacks. Its finisher move shoots an arrow into the sky that bursts out into several light streams of various colors raining down onto the battlefield. Yelvedal's Forge Form is a piercer-type weapon and bow, which works just like Xerneas's, but instead of using light, it uses darkness. That includes for its powerful finisher move, where it has dark energy cascading down onto the battlefield. Naturally, I had to make a forge form for this Pokemon, and it should be no surprise it's a sword, with its finisher move having the sword grow in size, covered in blue energy as the user lunges at the foe, executing a series of fierce slashes. Surprise, surprise, it gets a forge form weapon too, and shocker, it's a shield! Its powerful finisher move has it glow red as it lets out a massive roar that is unavoidable and shakes the entire battlefield while also dealing plenty of damage. And being a sword and shield, you could dual wield these two legendary weapons in double battles. The Pokemon Brain mascot legendary Ilruz's Forge Form weapon has been retconned from a piercer type to a slasher type so that all four of the divine Pokemon are a different weapon class. It is inspired by Norse trickster god Loki's infamous weapon, which has been depicted as a sword, spear, and staff. So I wanted to mix elements of all three together, and honestly, the slasher type would fit just as well. Its finisher move, Striking Illusions, summons a bunch of slithering shadows across the field that will quickly take shape into shadowy serpents that will pop out of the ground and continuously try to bite the foe. This marvelous forge form is wielded by Mastermind and Team Brain Leader, Loki. The Pokemon Brawn exclusive mascot legendary Pokemon, Stormer's forge form, is of course an electrified hammer modeled after Thor's infamous hammer, from Norse mythology, but I'm sure most of you will recognize it from the MCU. 
Crashing Thunder has the user lift the hammer into the sky in true Thor fashion as it's surging with electricity, which can hurt the foe before it even strikes down on the battlefield, having several powerful thunderbolts crash across the field, dealing even more damage. And of course, paralyzing all your foes. This mighty forge form is wielded by the headstrong leader of Team Braun, Thor. It's no surprise that the father of the Transforge mechanic and divine Pokemon of Loden, the star of the second DLC, The King's Bounty, has one of the most powerful Forge forms, being a piercer-type weapon inspired by Odin's infamous spear in Norse mythology. Its finisher move, Solemn Strike, has the user raise the spear into the air, with the wings on the top of the spear spreading before soaring into the sky, covered with shadowy energy with its sharp spear pointed ahead as the user continuously flies directly at the foe, with a bunch of shadowy feathers left in its wake. Edlodin also gains a new ability only while in its forge form called Secret Weapon, which doubles all forge force added to the forge force gauge, making it that much easier to use your finisher move, and quite possibly even more than once. And this is to honor the fact that Edlodin did, after all, create the Transforge mechanic. There is a reason this is one of the last Forge forms you will acquire in Brain and Brawn, as well as Legends Romdahl. This weapon's just a game changer. This all-powerful Forge form is wielded by none other than the Fearin champion Odin, who despite his age, is still a formidable and at times frightening foe. The face of the first DLC, The Queen's Beauty, the majestic Matriarch's Forge form is a sharp shield and defender type weapon. Its finisher move, Imperial Roar, has it make a roar as it summons the three legendary serpents that serve it to each make a quick attack on the foe. This Forge form is actually wielded by two trainers, first by Freya at the end of the first DLC, and then by your good friend Ragnar in your final fight. Based on a mythological sea creature, it only makes sense its forge form weapon would be a trident, and therefore piercer type weapon. Its finisher move Trident Force floods the field with rough sea waves that continuously shuffle enemies around, dealing significant amounts of damage with each wave. This legendary forge form is wielded by Hoenn champion Wallace as a secret boss at the end of the first DLC after defeating him in the Galdor Islands world-renowned Pokemon Contest Festival. The big battle of the Fearin region, as well as one of the ultimate weapons within the Fearin region, Frostfire's Forge Form weapon is a dual blade and slasher type that has a unique ability while only in this Forge Form known as Dual Destiny, which allows the user to attack twice in the traditional turn-based style sections of double battles, as long as you have no other Pokemon out. An ability antagonist Twyla makes use of in your climatic double battle, against her in the finale of the second DLC, which is essentially the final showdown of the entire Fearin region, with everything at stake in this Ragnarok level event, which is exactly what its finisher move, Doomsday Dual Blade, represents, as it brings Ragnarok to its foes, because if its formidable fire and ice infused attack lands, it will instantly KO the target. This is one of the strongest forge forms in the entire region, alongside Lodins and Romdals. The mythical Pokemon Viature not only has four unique forms, but four unique Forge Forms as well. The Forge Form weapon you wield will be determined by the Forge Form it's in while transforging it, and it is fairly easy to change its forms as each form has a signature attack that triggers its transformation. So you'll be able to use whichever Forge Form weapon you feel is best for any given situation, as it has a Forge Form weapon for each of the four weapon types. Viature's four Forge Forms, however, all share one powerful finisher move that has spiritual energy surge across the battlefield, dealing plenty of damage to all your foes and most likely finishing them off. I'd like to finish the video off by answering some common questions I've received or address some concerns or misconceptions about the Transforge mechanic and Forge Form weapons, starting with Shinies. And yes, all shiny Pokemon have their shiny colorations when transforged into their Forge Form weapons. You'd even be able to obtain some shiny Forge Form capable Pokemon in raid battles or through events. Another commonly asked question is whether or not Pokemon types have advantages within the war zones of the battle. And yes, type advantages do matter in the war zone sections of battle as well, but most attacks outside of finisher moves usually do such little damage, only chipping away at enemy health, so super effective attacks would do more, but still wouldn't do any crazy damage in the war zones unless using your finisher move. But of course that little extra damage would really add up fast and help you fill out your forge form gauge even faster. Not to mention do damage outside of the turn-based style sections, which is all always useful. I mean, look no further than status conditions such as burn or poison. Some people suggested, oh, what if the Pokemon held the weapons? Well, certainly fun in theory and definitely something I considered when conceptualizing the Transforge mechanic and Forge form weapons. 
It's just not very plausible and was a logistical nightmare. The reason I didn't do that is because not all Pokemons have the same anatomy. Only a handful of Pokemon even have the means to lift a weapon, let alone actually wield one. For example, you can't have a Jigglypuff really hold a giant hammer. Most Pokemon don't even have hands or arms. So I just felt that would limit the mechanic way too much. Especially as only some Pokemon can even transforge into a Forge Form weapon in the first place. It also defeated the purpose of the mechanic as narratively speaking, it's about the bond between people and Pokemon working together in battle. This is a huge aspect of the region, its lure, and the story of the Firin region, as it really raises the stakes within the war between the two factions, and is even a big part of the mechanic's origin story and why Ed Loden created it in the first place in Pokemon Legends Realm Doll. This isn't Pokemon, or Pokemon would never do this. Hey, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and I'm not here to argue with anyone, or even defend myself or this mechanic. I'm just here to have fun creating, and I'm actually very proud of this mechanic. I knew going in that it would be controversial, as even all the new canon gimmicks usually are. And I'm beyond pleased with the overall positive reception it has received. But I do want to offer some insight and more perspective on my own personal opinion on the matter, as I honestly don't believe this to be true. So maybe this would be true for the old school games, pre-gimmicks, but the games have been getting progressively more mature for years now. Look at Pokemon Legends Arceus, for example, where death is mentioned multiple times and the trainers can literally be attacked or even killed by Pokemon, like Cleaver, whose arms are literal axes. In fact, many Pokemon have lethal weapons as part of their anatomy, wield them, and some even are weapons. And when the trainer or your Pokemon are attacked by these Pokemon, there is no severed limbs or blood, no one dies, the Transforge mechanic would be no different than that. I mean, we have Pokemon like Wailord, who can use Body Slam on a Caterpie, Charizard, who can use Fire Blast on an Oddish, a Voltorb can use Explosion, and there are no real consequences for any of this. Pokemon has always been a fantastical world, void of real logic, and just asking us to suspend disbelief. In most cases, we do it without them even having to ask. So I don't understand why people overthink it so much. But to be fair, plenty of people have said the same thing about new Pokemon designs every generation, not to mention every single canon Pokemon mechanic, including Mega Evolutions when they were first announced, comparing it to Digimon. Oh, that's not Pokemon, that's Digimon. Oh, this isn't a Pokemon, this is Mega Man. They ran out of ideas. The series is constantly evolving, and new gimmicks especially are supposed to break the mold and introduce new ways to play, which is what I feel this mechanic does. And I know I'm biased, but I personally would much rather something like this over the goofy looking crystal hats we got in Scarlet and Violet. And if you told me years ago that, or even Dynamax, would be a part of Pokemon, I most likely wouldn't have believed you. But here we are, and I don't expect the new gimmicks to stop anytime soon, and I only expect them to get even crazier as the franchise continues to evolve because there's really only so much you can do, without them starting to feel too redundant or repetitive after a while. Anyways, these were the most commonly asked questions or um, comments I get about the mechanic, but if you have any of your own you'd like to ask, please feel free to ask me down below in the comment section. I would love to answer them for you. But I really hope that this video already answered a lot of your questions about this mechanic and how it works, and of course that you enjoyed learning more about it, as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with all of you. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, please feel free to leave a comment down below, and don't forget to support all of the amazing artists who helped draw all of my concepts and designs so I could take you on this journey through my imagination. Thanks for watching.